Welcome to this year's annual TB Davy Academic Freedom Lecture. Special welcome to Mr. Max Dupreer, our guest lecturer, Chair of Council, Bishop Linton Dungani, the Chair of President of Convocation, Mrs. Mary Burton, members of the Academic Freedom Committee and the Committee's Chair, Mr. Jacques Rousseau, distinguished guests, colleagues, students, ladies and gentlemen. The annual Academic Freedom Lecture is held in honor of the late Thomas Benjamin Davy, who was the Vice Chancellor of the University of Cape Town from 1948 to 1955. In the early 1950s, Dr. Davy bravely defended the principles of academic freedom and university autonomy in the face of apartheid laws that were being implemented under the new nationalist government from 1948 laws that attempted to subjugate higher education to political goals, ideological goals, and government structures. He understood academic freedom as the university's right to determine who shall be taught, who shall teach, what shall be taught, and how it shall be taught. <clears throat> and that these rights of the university were to be held without regard to any criterion except academic merit. This conceptualization of T.B. Davies was of course in a particular context, the context of a government that was trying to interfere with the appointment of staff and prevent certain staff from lecturing at this university and other liberal universities, hence the right to determine who shall teach, Interference from the government about who could come to the university as a student. In segregating the universities, black students were being excluded. Hence the freedom to determine who shall be taught. And interference in the curricula uh, that people wished to teach. Hence the freedom to determine, for the university to determine what shall be taught and how it shall be taught. Dr. Davy passed away while visiting the United Kingdom in 1955, and following his passing, Vice Chancellor of the University of Liverpool said the following about the man whom he called that rare spirit. Tom Davy's pronouncements on the fundamental nature of the university, he said, are amongst the noblest utterances of academic statesmanship. On him were fixed the eyes of all who value freedom within the university and without. The fight he fought was not for his own university alone, the University of Cape Town, but for all of us. Dr. Davies' stand in, 19, in early 1950s certainly helped establish the University of Cape Town as a top university because it established its presence and its role as a member of that international community of universities that shared particular values, the values of academic freedom. In many ways, that context in which T.B. Davy was speaking has changed, clearly for the better. While, and, and, and as a result of that change, we ne also need to rethink what we mean by academic freedom. And one of the fundamental purposes of the series of lectures of the T.B. Davy Lecture is to have thought leaders from South Africa and around the world help us rethink what academic freedom means today. But let me suggest some of the changes that the Academic Freedom Committee grapples with. While we are certainly less anxious, although the danger is not gone, we are less anxious about direct government interference with the appointment of staff. We, are, we have been protected for many years now from government interference with the selection of students, or with telling us what we should teach or how we should teach. Although it has to be said that in the last, about two weeks ago, the Minister of Higher Education uh, proposed a compulsory curriculum that all students should have to study in, uh, uh, that would ensure their loyalty to South Africa in one way or another. But be that as it may, we believe that the systems, the universities of higher education in South Africa are amongst the freest and most autonomous in the world. And, and that's really something to be proud of, to celebrate and to protect. So why the need for an annual academic freedom lecture today? <coughs> It's because I think that context that is changing introduces other kinds of 
concerns and interference. One of those is the chilling effect that funding from corporate sponsors and donors has on our research. When that research, when that funding might result in our choosing to research some areas rather than other areas, uh, and might choose us to be less than vociferous in the results of our research. Another context is the concern that when views are really strongly held in the university, and when protest is allowed and encouraged, that too has a chilling effect on those who hold different views and, are, and feel less free to express them. For us, I think preserving academic freedom at UCT is about ensuring that UCT remains an argumentative university, a place of different opinions, extreme opinions, of conflict in a way, but of conflict, but of, of a space that protects that conflict. And if I look back just over this year and look at the debates that we have held on campus, in the media, in the press, I feel proud that we are upholding those values. In the last couple of weeks, we have seen very different views expressed about Gaza and the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and have tried to protect the space for that debate to take place, the debate about boycotts included, academic boycotts. We had a guest lecture, what's becoming an annual lecture and a memorial about Marikana, and a debate, controversial debate here about where does responsibility lie. We had the president of Chile, uh, President Michel Bachelet, on campus two Sundays ago, uh, engaged in a gender dialogue around domestic and sexual violence and gender equality, and what really are the obstacles to that. In the same line, sexual identity and gender issues has been an issue, and we've been debating what position do we take on homophobic laws passed in other African countries and which affect our own students who are here and who want to return to those countries. And it's not automatic that because most of us think and because our constitution protects uh, sexual orientation, those rights, that we should make it an uncomfortable place for people who have who, who valorize traditional value systems value systems that do not think that homosexuality, homosexuality is acceptable. And we must not create, allow an environment to develop where those views can't be expressed at UCT because they're controversial or unpopular. We've had debates about the outsourcing of certain services and labor-related issues and what we do about that. We have had uh, debates, or there is a debate stimulated by a couple of students about the artworks in the university and whether they are Eurocentric to the point of creating a hostile environment for students from different cultural backgrounds. That particular issue speaks to our T.B. Davy lecturer from uh, 2012, Ferial Hafiji, whose main focus of the address was the artwork Spear of the Nation, uh, which was a satirical piece uh, around the President Zuma. And there have been more issues, the admissions policy, the debate about whether we have, uh, what we can do about not having enough black professors and how affirmative action should work. These are debates which I'm proud to say I think UCT leads in the public arena and that is indeed the role of the university. As we strive to preserve and extend these freedoms, academic freedom, we need to ensure that our staff, students and guests have the opportunities to speak freely and openly and in safe spaces. This trio of freedoms, free speech, academic freedom, freedom of assembly, are, are a constitutive part of the university and at the very core of our value system. So it is, it is really an important tradition, this annual lecture, I think, to preserve, because while the context of a apartheid government, which was the original trigger, for well, this lecture has changed, uh, I believe that we still face challenges and will continue to, and that the lecturers we invite will help shape our thinking uh, of the role of academic freedom in the university today. Now it gives me pleasure to call on Mr. Jacques Rousseau, to the chair of the Academic Freedom Committee, to introduce today's distinguished lecture.
The Academic Freedom Committee is very pleased to welcome Mr. Max Dupria to deliver the 49th Annual T.B. Davy Memorial Academic Freedom Lecture. I'm sure Mr. Dupria is, is not a stranger to many of you, but I'd like to just offer a, a potted summary of, of some of the highlights of the last 40 years of his career in journalism. He's earned numerous local and international awards for his fearless and principled reporting, including the Nat Nakasa Award for Courageous Journalism, and he was named the Yale Globalist International Journalist. He's the author of numerous books that draw on his long history in South African culture and politics, most recently A Rumor of Spring, in which he reflects on whether South Africa can expect a long winter or an early spring in relation to the evolution of our democracy. In 1992, UCT awarded Max Dupria an honorary Master of Social Science degree, and the citation from that day is perhaps worth revisiting. It speaks of, begin quote, his fearless exposition of power corruption in high places in the face of all kinds of attempts at silencing him, from criminal and civil proceedings in the courts to extrajudicial strong-arm methods. Max Dupree has consistently made it clear that he is not serving any sectional interest, but that of the, all the people in this country, and that his cause is to promote the values that should operate in the new South Africa. After graduating from Stellenbosch University, he joined De Burger as a cub reporter and the editor sent it to cover the parliamentary sessions. This proved to be an error of judgment. Max Dupree's overall impression of the parliament was one of moral corruption and intellectual poverty, and he conveyed this in his reports. De Burger's impression of Max Dupree was that they had a problem reporter on their hands. He was hastily transferred to De Beelt in Johannesburg. There he reported on the Mozambican independence and the Soweto riots of June 16, 1976, but caused so many problems for the government supporting Nationale Pers that he was banished to the Siberia of South Africa, the Namibian desk. In Vintuk, he was quickly branded a Swapo ally, and Dupree and the Nationale Pers soon parted company. In 1980, he joined the Financial Mail in the post of political editor, the only Afrikaner on the staff, and in his own words, their token boor. Later, he transferred within the same media group as political correspondent to the Sunday Times and Business Day. In 1987, Dr. Fancel Slabert invited Dupree to join the delegation of Africana personalities who attended that highly controversial and historic meeting with the then banned African National Congress in Dakar, Senegal. It was there that the idea of starting an independent Afrikaans language weekly newspaper was born. End quote. That newspaper, launched in 1988, was Die Freie Wirkblatt, the independent weekly. The newspaper was almost immediately in court thanks to the first few editions having to appear on the streets illegally, after the Minister of Justice responded to the threat it posed by raising the cost of registering a newspaper from 10 rand to 30,000 rand. At this newspaper, it was Dupree and his colleague Jacques Poe who led the exposure of apartheid-era murder squads at Flakplatz, when other publications wanted no part of the story, or simply denied its truthfulness. Without their hard work and courage, many of these details might well have remained a secret to this day. The paper was forced to close in February 1994, thanks to the costs incurred in, de in defending its charge that the South African Police General Lothar Neertlung had supplied poison to security police to kill activists. Dupree went on to become the founder and editor of the television program Special Report, focusing on the TRC and Special Assignment. Dupree ended up being dismissed from special assignment for gross insubordination towards management after objecting to a management decision to screen a segment on witchcraft. That same weekend, special assignment won six awards at a television prize giving. If a more recent sort of threat by actor and economic freedom fighter Fano Mokuena to seize his farm is more typical these days, it's not because Dupree has slowed down or toned down his challenges to political authority and the abuse of power. Nor could it, in fact, be because he has a farm, because he has none. But accuracy is seldom a primary concern for bullies. It might instead be exactly because, thanks in part to him and other courageous editors, newspapers in South Africa no longer need fear being bombed, as the Freya Wehrblatt officers were in 1991. To briefly return to that 1992 citation, Mr. Chancellor, the sensational disclosures which struck at the malignant core of apartheid are only part of Max Dupree's achievement. He is clearly a non-conformist, an independent thinker, a maverick. Some would use stronger terms. The French noun might be sans culotte, without breeches. In Afrikaans, the expression is earthier. 
is a harachat. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Max Dupriya. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for the kind words. Um, <clears throat> the picture you um, heard painted about me implies that I'm a very honest person. So maybe I should come clean on something that does not appear on the CV that my publicists dish out. I have this distinction of being fired from journalism, from newspapers, more than anybody else in this country. I've been fired three times for insubordination by Stephen Mulholland, by Ken Owen, and by none other than the esteemed Dr. Snooki Zekalala of the SABC. I just thought, you know, come clean. And I'm a bit puzzled how it happened that I was asked to give this uh, lecture on academic freedom. I'm not an academic. Uh, I'm a bit of a populist, and I've known, been known to be very scathing about the relevance of academics in South African society. So I will not be quoting famous philosophers today. No learned scholars, scholars will get mentioned. And my only footnote to the speech is the one that is similar to the one that nowadays appears under my column in the newly, uh, in the new independent newspapers group. These views do not reflect the, those of the University of Cape Town. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a very special honor. Uh, it is very special to speak uh, in this famous hall. As you heard, I had done this once before. I have a very soft spot for UCT. Uh, and this started when I was a student at Stellenbosch University in the early 70s. I grew up in a very conservative Christian Afrikaner nationalist home in the Free State Plotland. And I became frustrated that Stellenbosch was just more of the same, that it was insulated from the world and did not allow me to spread my intellectual wings. But perhaps I should just take one step back. I had a very privileged and secluded childhood under apartheid. As a teenager and as a young student, I never questioned apartheid. I lived in a white world with black people, with the unimported extra scurrying around, scurrying around in the background. But when I was intellectually stimulated at university, my mind started becoming a bit more restless. I find it, looking back, astonishing that my first stirring of political awareness was not the ample evidence of brutal oppression of fellow citizens around me, but came when the National Guards, National Guard shot four students at Kent State University in Ohio who were protesting against the Vietnam War. I remember how outraged I was as a young student at Stellenbosch. But this led me to pay more attention to what was happening at the time at UCT. I remember that was the time when uh, student activists on English language campuses had, were beginning to morph from hippies and liberals to, to radicals, even Marxists. I came across a UCT academic called Rick Turner, um, who was to have a very strong influence on my thinking. Rick Turner was more than just a lecturer and academic. He engaged the society right up to the day that he was assassinated by the apartheid security police. And then one day, I think it was about 1972, I traveled from Stellenbosch to Cape Town to attend one of the UCT, the New SAS pro protests. I listened to a student leader who I'd never met before, the name of Jeff Budlander, addressing the protest, and I witnessed the police beating up the students on the steps of St. George's Cathedral. I was never the same after that. Jeff Budlander wasn't just a fashionable radical who went on to make lots of money. Um, he was one of those activists bred by this university that stayed an activist for human rights and had a real impact. And Jeff engaged with the society right from his student days, and he still does so today. He's a very special man. 
The other reason for my warm feelings towards this university, as you heard, was that it awarded me an honorary degree 22 years ago, while I was persona non grata with the establishment, and particularly Africana society. And that was the last time I spoke here. I was formally handed on the stage my certificate by the then Chancellor of UCT, Harry Oppenheimer, and then to the acute embarrassment of my hosts, I proceeded to launch a vicious attack on monopoly capital and on the mine owners that were exploiting the workers and perpetuated the migrant labor system. It struck me last year, I could have repeated that speech two decades later after the Marikana massacre. I'm sensing Jacques wanting me to stay on topic. But allow me, allow me one more off-topic remark. I am a senior research fellow at the University of Fort Hare, and I'm an associate professor at the University of the Northwest. Now, to put it mildly, mildly Alice and Potchestrom are not two different planets, they're two different solar systems. The University of Fort Hare was the factory where African leaders were produced. Nelson Mandela, Oliver Tambo, Robert Subukwe, Kenneth Kaunda, Julius Nyerere, Robert Mugabe, Mangosuti Butelezi, and others. Watch of Strum gave us F.W. de Klerk and Peter Mulder. So with that rich history, one would have expected Fort Hare to have become the jewel in the intellectual crown of a liberated and free South Africa. What does it say about us as a society that not Fort Hare nor any of those other traditionally black universities like Turfloop or Venda um, or Transkei University, all with new names now, is ranked among the top 10 universities in this country? What does it say us about us as a society that we knowingly perpetuate inequality by providing excellent school education to white and black middle class kids and totally neglect education in townships, squatter camps, and rural areas. Our transition from apartheid and tyranny to democracy was so seamless that we fell into the trap of thinking it was business as usual, just with a few adjustments and replacing the white faces in the black Mercedes Benzes with black faces. Okay, so back to topic. The, the, the task of a university is not primarily to produce economically active citizens. Universities worldwide are responsible for advancing human knowledge and how that knowledge impacts on society. Now, while this principle is universal, its application is society specific. There's no way, no way universities in South Africa can go about their business without focusing their minds on the specific demands and needs of our society on the legacies of colonialism and apartheid, on the transition to democracy, on the transformation of society, on the issue, issues of identity and social cohesion and poverty and unemployment and inequality. And add to that public health, land reform, urban planning, urbanization, history, and so on. I will not focus on academic freedom regarding universities' relationship to the state. And I can hear the Vice Chancellor sigh a sigh of relief that I'm not known as an Mbongi for the present Minister of Higher Education. I also don't want to talk about how universities handle their freedom internally, although I have very strong views on the topic. I, I must add that I'm encouraged by the stand that the leadership of this unit of the university has taken on several occasions and public matters. I would rather share a few thoughts but the other leg of academic freedom and responsibility, namely the role of academics in the public discourse inside and outside their field of expertise. The point I'm trying to make is as an academic, senior student, if you don't live up to your responsibility, you run the risk of forfeiting some of your freedom. I'm talking about society's demand that universities produce public intellectuals and participate actively and visibly in public life. This has to do with the second leg of my definition of the role of universities, namely the impact knowledge has on the betterment of society. 
An informed, considered, tolerant, and heterogeneous public opinion is a precondition for a true democratic society. It is our one shortcoming as a society as we struggle to establish a proper democratic society in the fullest sense of the world in a very short time, after such a long time of oppression and minority rule. Paradoxically, we have become, South African society has become probably the most open society outside the major Western democracy, democracies. This is more a result, I think, of the history of resistance to apartheid and the nature of our political settlement in 1994 and the constitution that it brought than of the instincts and culture of our people. The essence of Africana nationalism, the force that dominated South Africa for so long, militated against openness and tolerance. The instincts of the liberation movement in exile between 1960 and 1990 were not much different for other reasons, uh, as the experiences of dissidents in Contuwe where camps and the behavior of some MK commanders had proved. But the National Party negotiators suddenly became arch-liberals when they negotiated the political settlement, insisting on every kind of personal freedom as to limit, so as to limit the freedom, uh, limit the future actions of the majority government. The ANC, in turn, could not afford then to turn against the liberal principles it had espoused during its fight, its international campaign with the anti-apartheid movement against the apartheid regime. And so we got a dispensation that went contrary to the views of the majority of the people, a constitutional rather than a parliamentary or majoritarian democracy, a constitution that guaranteed free speech, freedom of the media, and unpopular things such as the right to abortion, a ban on capital punishment, no discrimination on the basis of race, ethnicity, gender, or sexuality, and provision for, the, for a public protector and a human rights commission. Can you imagine how many people in the Tuli House today wish they had never agreed to the public protector being part of our constitution. This disconnect that we're experiencing manifests itself regularly with the governing ANC's sharp reaction to criticism by the media, by artists, civil society, and political opponents. With the attacks on this constitutional court when the court decides against the executive, with its threats against press freedom, secrecy bill, with its brutal control over the public broadcaster, with its blatant manipulation of the criminal justice system and its tolerance of police brutality. We have now lived with this almost artificial openness for two decades, and some of it is really beginning to feel normal to us. And while we have this gift, we should make the best of use of it. By the look of things, especially the last week, this openness might not last forever. The sheer lunacy of the war of words between the ANC and the EFF the last week is a reminder of that. We had the bizarre situation where the once proud liberation movement, a party that got 62% of the vote in the election, threatened strong arm tactics, even riot police inside our highest legislative body after a simple verbal confrontation in Parliament. We have the leader of a new party that contested of free and fair democratic elections in May and received a million votes, threatened two nights ago on public radio to form a military wing and go underground to start a new guerrilla war. We seem to have forgotten about the more than 10,000 people that died in the five years before 1994 in conflict between the ANC, UDF on the one side and in Qatar on the other side. What I think we need desperately is a greater stimulation of nuanced thinking and a decent exchange of ideas across all sectors of society. We have not, as a society, rid ourselves of the fears and prejudices that come from the lack of knowledge of the other. Inequality in income and lifestyle is a huge barrier, as is race, but it's important that while we tackle this long and difficult project of establishing a more just society, 
that we should at least keep on talking across the racial, class, and urban-rural divides to at least get a sense of each other's dreams and fears and struggles. With the exception, perhaps, of talk radio, our mainstream media have failed this challenge. Editors and journalists, nowadays most of them are, were born just before or just after uh, our transition, are caught like hairs in the headlights of increasing pressure by owners to be more profitable, to serve a particular master, and because of the threat of social and digital media that they really don't understand how to deal with. The public broadcaster should have and could have played a leading role in informing and stimulating public opinion, but it, is, it has become a tragic comedy with a ter really terrible script. There are pockets of excellence remaining in our media landscape, but these are only serving a small elite. Our investigative reporting is still good, excellent, and has served our democracy well. But investigative reporting, South African style, seldom goes beyond unearthing scandal and corruption. Enter public intellectual, that animal trained and equipped to think critically, to expand, expand the parameters of national conversations, to stir up controversies, to bring new insights and fresh angles. In a country poor of privately funded research institutions, think tanks, we have to rely on our ac university academics to play this role. Where are our Noam Chomskys? Where are our Zizeks, our Wallace Yinkas, Edward Sahids, Gugi Wationgos, uh, Susan Sontags, Camille Paglias, list is long of people we, we know and enjoy. We have young, bright young sparks that will take over the baton from Njabula and Debele and Neville Alexander and Francelle Slobert. Why could we never produce another Steve Biko? Instead, we rely on old men long dead for our political inspiration, like Vladimir Lenin and Franz Fanon. We need academics to step off campus much more often and fill the gaps left by the media, by the political establishment and the faith communities. This will also enrich the universities and their students because to engage with society also means receiving feedback and understanding society better. I know quite a few young and gifted intellectuals and academics who prefer to stay inside the safe confines of their classrooms and their research desks. They feel it is simply too risky, too traumatic to get caught up in the rough and tumble of the often crude and robust public discourse in South Africa. And yes, it can be very problematic. The public discourse is so poor at the moment that we don't often go beyond ad hominem attacks and attaching labels. Labels such as liberal, neoliberal, anarchist, us negro, Racist, race beta, race traitor, neo leftist, communist, capitalist, socialist, and the latest one that the right wingers love to use, libtard. I think it's supposed to be a liberal retard. I'm one of those. Uh, I know about these labels because I had every single one of them um, hung around my neck. On occasion, even all of them on the same issue. This kind of interaction became officially sanctioned after the ANC's 2007 Polokwane conference, where Thabo Mbeki was, so, uh, was dispatched so unceremoniously and in such a crude way. That day signaled the rise of a new era of cheap populism, which gave us, among other things, the hysteria around Brett Murray's uh, Zuma Pierce painting, some of Zapir's cartoons. The formation of the economic freedom fighters gave new impetus to this phenomenon, politics by slogan, political discourse by insult and threat. This new culture is strengthened by the failure of the disastrous education system of the last 20 years and the strong anti-intellectual bent of our current president. It's not only the public discourse that has become a bit of a danger zone. The debates between academics themselves have become even more petty, vicious, and personal at times, as insecure little people try to defend their turf. 
I don't have much to tell other academics and intellectuals. If there's anything, I, something that I can tell them is this. Grow a thick skin very quickly and accept abuse as proof that you've reached at least some people. If your arguments are strong, your information is sound, and you remain consistent, even your worst enemies will eventually respect your integrity. And that's all you need. Accept that this is a rough neighborhood in South Africa where hyperbole and insult, insult are the currency, and you will be able to witness the impact your voice is making. Demand your freedom to be a forthright public intellectual and then practice that freedom. I'm widely viewed as anti-DA and anti-ANC and anti-EFF and anti-Communist Party and anti-everything else. Uh, and yet I regularly have friendly and fruitful discussions with private discussions with people from all those formations. And I remember last year the ANC, I had said something very disrespectful president and the ANC declared in a statement that I was an enemy of the people. And one of uh, the top, really top guys in the ANC thought it might hurt my feelings and he phoned me late night and he said, it's not personal comrade, comrade it's, just, it's just politics. But there is another impediment stopping academics and intellect, intellectuals to actively engage with society. It is called snobbery. If you write a piece and it doesn't quote at least a few international experts and it doesn't have a few no footnotes at the bottom of each page, if it, needs, if it doesn't need a dictionary to decipher, then it's unworthy of a true intellectual. If you write a book under 500 pages and your book can be read by someone with a matric in under a week, then you had compromised your intellectual integrity. What rubbish is that? Of course there is a need for specialized and purely academic research and writing. But there's an equal obligation on you as an intellectual in this society to make sure that the knowledge you are accumulating and dealing with also has an impact on the betterment of society, not only of your students. I think the custom of uh, publishing peer-reviewed articles in reputable academic magazines is a good and an old one but I would propose a new criterion to judge academic excellence by. For every academic article, an academic should also be able to show a piece in a mainstream newspaper or magazine or an interview on radio or television. A quick word on social media. Twitter, Facebook, Insta even Instagram have become far too big and powerful for intellectuals not to use. I follow Zizek and Dawkins and Chomsky on Twitter, for example. I'm happy to say my friend Jacques Rousseau here is one of those intellectuals who are using social media intelligently and very effectively. There's a massive audience out there you cannot afford to ignore. To give you an example, two weeks ago I posted my regular newspaper column on Facebook and a week later I checked. I had 4,000 4, people clicked on the like button. 3,000 people shared it on their own Facebook pages. 900 people commented on it. Now, that is a much bigger audience than I get when my columnist is published in three newspapers. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying we don't have public intellectuals and academics engaged in public life. I'm just saying we just have far too few. And it's very risky to, sort, to, to uh, single out anybody, but I could mention the example of Pierre de Foss from this university. Um, he has done more than most to un help understand, uh, South Africans understand the Constitution. His blog is very popular. He links it to Twitter and Facebook, and it draws more attention. He regularly features on radio and television. And, uh, and true to the role of a public intellectual, he, only doesn't, he doesn't only talk about the Constitution. He comments on gender, on sexuality, and on the excesses of the surfacing, resurfacing of Afrikaner kind of nationalism. Let me give you three other examples of how an engagement by academics in the public discourse has worked well. The first one is the sensational criminal trial of Oscar Pistorius. Law professors, lecturers, senior counsel went on radio and television every day to explain what was happening inside the court and what it meant. Thanks to them, the millions of people who had followed the trial on television and radio know a lot more about our law, our legal system, 
and the functioning of our, of our courts than before. The second uh, example is the controversy raging right now around Tim Noakes and the Banting Diet. It is a robust debate with much mudslinging, but it has raised awareness among millions, and academics have regularly weighed in with their specialist knowledge and insights. I think that it took a bit long, but the intervention of uh, the medical faculty here uh, was a great one and brought a new balance. The third example is the Marikana massacre of August 2012. We all saw the TV footage, we heard the statements from the police and from the mine management and the trade unions, and then an academic of the University of Johannesburg took his team to Marikana and pieced together what really happened. It was a very different story from what the police and the mine management had told us. That was proper public engagement. Um, I, I should perhaps mention that while we're talking about Marikana, that the most incisive reporting on that massacre did not come from our mainstream media but from an online news organization with very limited funds called Daily Maverick. Daily Maverick really is one of the shining stars in our media constellation. Instead of trying to compete with digital media and social media in breaking little stories, it gives you context and background and interpretation every morning. So I'm saying if only we could tackle and popularize education and health issues and economic policies in the same way as the Oscar trial, the Tim Noakes diet, and Marikana, we would have a much better informed public opinion. If we spend, we could spend as much energy and exposure on issues such as housing and transport and urban planning and public health as we spent on these controversies, we would have deepened our democracy significantly. Too often we think when we talk about public intellectual, we only talk about politics. I've been heartened by the emergence of a few very talented young black intellectuals engaged in the public sphere. They literally had to fight for their space and their audience because white intellectuals have been dominating for so long. They now have that space. They now have that audience. I hope they grow in confidence very quickly because our society desperately needs their voices. I have a lot of sympathy for young black academics asserting themselves and sometimes feeling pangs of insecurity and frustration. White arrogance, smugness, and ignorance can be extremely irritating and annoying. As you heard, I started my journalistic career in the Afrikaans newspaper. Early 80s, they stopped using my copy because I, my sentiments had drifted towards the UDF here and in Swapo in Namibia. Um, I naively thought that just by going over to the English language newspapers, I would have new freedom. So I went to work for the Financial Mail and the Sunday Times. When I first walked into that newsroom, I felt as if I was, as Jacques said, the token boor. Those editors wanted me to report on the inside stories of the Afrikaner Bruderbund, the Ingekerk, and the National Party. And I became almost paranoid in my insecurity. I thought they laughed at my Afrikaans accent. They thought I was a typical, I thought they thought I was a bit of, as we used the term in those days, a hairy back rock spider. I actually one day overheard uh, one colleague referring to me as Yapi. Um, I don't know if any of you remember that word. So I knew I had to work a little bit harder, get better stories, and write it better to overcome the prejudice and to compete with my English language colleagues. A year or two later, those colleagues of mine became my closest friends. It turned out that much of my insecurity was more a result of what was going on inside my own head than in my environment. Of course, there were a few genuine bigots, but once I got my confidence, I could just laugh at them. And I hope what I'm saying today doesn't discourage white intellectuals and make them withdraw. I really think whites should be sensitive and careful about how they are perceived in public, but not to the point where it is insulting and patronizing to their black counterparts. And white intellectual exile is the last thing we need. 20 years after we became a democracy, 
I feel the need to say that I see signs that our freedom is shrinking. It is imperative that we turn this around before we land on the slippery slope to authoritarianism. Right now, we need more freedom, more openness, more freedom of speech, more academic freedom, more tolerance. Paradoxically, the, uh, the phenomenon of Julius Malema and the EFF, while in themselves not shining examples of tolerance and free, free speech, would help us expand our openness. Because Malema is the child of a township, a single mother family, because he came from inside the ANC, because he speaks on behalf, he says, the poor and the marginalized African majority, he has a license to say things to those in power that nobody had before, that nobody had said before. Things, he says things that were previously called un-African or culturally insensitive. So I'm saying Julius Malema has seriously undermined the culture of blind respect for the so-called leaders of the people and the elders. He has broken quite a few taboos and made it possible for others to be bolder when they speak truth to power. We should harness that new opportunity, but we should also be vigilant that the new almost fascist tendencies we have witnessed recently do not take root in our society. I urge you, the students and the academics of this university, to assert your freedom to fight the good fight for an open society and a deepening of our democracy. Thank you very much. We have, <clears throat> we have roughly 10 minutes for questions, so if there are any questions, I invite you to raise your hands, and there are roving mics, I believe. Yes. Okay, I, I'm just, I, I just, it's a question about clarification um, to, to various things that you've said. Um, you described um, the, our, our democratic um, transition, particularly the, um, the negotiation, um, as one of... Um, um, arch liberalism that 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 um, um, displays an, an artificial openness in our in our, in our in our current society, and then what we in fact need is um, greater nuanced thinking. So, um, if you could just help us understand what what you mean by more nuanced thinking, as opposed to what we're doing right now. Thank you. If I want, I, you want me to expand on what I mean, what we need more of. Or do you want me to go back to 94 and explain why I said these people suddenly became liberals? Oh, okay. Thank you. It, it is a hot topic in South Africa today. And wherever I go, I get lots of arguments that, that, that the 94 settlement was a sellout. Um, you get a, a young black company, that's almost the standard response, that the 1994 settlement was a sellout. I think people need a bit of a broader view, and, and maybe I can offer it, because I had been in the front row of what had been happening in the society literally since 1974 uh, as a journalist. Um, I had seen all the wars in, re in, in the region. I saw the conflict in the society. I bore the brunt also of the uh, apartheid machinery. Um, what happened in 1994 remains a remarkable event. It is easy now not to, f not to remember how formidable a machine the National Party had, a military machine, a police machine, um, how they had controlled the economy, how they had closed down the society. Um, and we can argue for a long time why they then decided to negotiate. I think it would be unfair to say it was only because of economics. It was only because of international isolation. 
there was a, a, a small amount of model debate also going on in Afrikaner. But then they got to 1990, the wall had come down, and they knew this is an opportunity. What they wanted in 1990 was vastly different from what they got in 1994. What they wanted in 1990 was a white veto. They wanted own affairs. Uh, they wanted a, a, a rotating president. They wanted a perpetuation of a form of apartheid. And they got none of that. What I, was meant, what I meant earlier was that they, they, the, the freedoms that they insisted on, the individual freedoms, were freedoms that they had denied everybody until that point. And suddenly now they said, well, what if these darkies do to us what we did to them? So let's put this into the Constitution, which is a good thing. If we hadn't made our peace then, I would not be standing here. I really, w we wouldn't be sitting here. Um, our society had reached a very close to combustion point then. We literally had tens of thousands of people in jail. Uh, thousands of people were dying every month. It, it, there was no postponement of this process. The economy was completely in ruins. South Africa was virtually bankrupt. So you had to have a transition, and very quickly. But more importantly, you had to have stability. And I know that has become a very uh, unpopular message, the one of stability. But I beg people, if you, if you want to, to propose any kind of situation where we will lose our stability, our, it is our greatest asset, is our stability. If you want to propose something where we will lose our stability, please go to Iraq, go to Pakistan, go to Ukraine, go to Sudan, go to the Yemen, go to all these places and see that a society that, you can, that seems, like Ukraine, seems fairly stable, and it oversteps a mark, and a few things happen, and that society disintegrates. I, I am seriously afraid that what we've been dealing with in the last few weeks are potentially those kind of steps. This new conflict between the ANC and, 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 and the EFF, and the EFF strategies, if we're not careful, could lead us again uh, into that kind of instability. So we, ca we kept stability, but we paid a very high price for stability. And that price was that the status quo, at least as far as the economy is concerned, remained. Now, the EFF and the Communist Party all blame Mandela and Becky and these guys for the deal they made in 94 the, on, on the economy. I was there. I was sort of moving around these people there wasn't much of a choice. The ANC w were not prepared uh, with a, a, its own economic model. In fact, they didn't even have their own ec economists who came to the table. They had uh, Ticho Mbuweni, Maria Ramos, Praveen Gordon, Trevor Manuel, and Thabo Mbeki. That, that was the team. Um, and the whole world and all the mining houses and corporate South Africa descended upon them in 1990 and said, Let's tell, show you around the world what happens if you nationalize, if you turn your back on economic growth and go for redistribution instead. I think people like uh, those five specifically, but specifically Thabo Mbeki, knew that there was a nervousness in the world that here was a black liberation movement whom even Margaret Thatcher, a few years ago, had called a bunch of terrorists. They had a sort of a bit of a Marxist bent. Their best mates were in Moscow. That they were now taking over the most sophisticated democracy, uh, economy in Africa. The world was nervous about it. So if these guys had come then and said, we're going to take a shortcut, we're going to nationalize the mines and the banks, um, it would have sent shockwaves. We would have disturbed that very difficult equilibrium at the time. So I completely understand why they had to make that choice. It wasn't one that they made easy, easily. The mistake we made came after. That now we're the darlings of the world in the Mandela era. 
we have a bit of economic growth, we have a bit of foreign direct investment, and now we sat back. We did the same with the Truth Commission. We took the Truth, Truth Commission on with all sincerity. It really was a magnificent process, and then we sat back and th thought we had done our job. We are now reconciled. Well, we're clearly not. Uh, clearly, we also did not address the structural challenges in our economy since then. And one of the main reasons why we're in the mess we are, even if we retained a so-called new liberal market, free market uh, economy, was bad governance. Um, look at local government. Um, nobody gets a clean audit anymore. Look at, look at corruption. Look at bureaucratic bungling. If we had done all those things correctly, we could have sal salvaged something from being forced into a new liberal economy. And the main thing I will say again, look how we stuffed up education. It is unforgivable. It is absolutely unforgivable. Uh, we will pay for another generation for what we have done to the education of our black kids over the last 20 years. So uh, with that, there, there are many things that I'm sure we can all draw from that provocative and, and somewhat inspirational uh, talk. And one thing that's clear to me is that as much as it's easy to become fatigued by the hyperbole and the moral panics that much of our media like to propagate and foist upon us, and I'm sure many of you have the same sorts of conversations as I do around dinner tables where we complain about the lack of analysis and insight that we read, if we don't play our part in redressing that balance in a sense, if we give up that space entirely, then we have ourselves to blame, at least to some extent. And if we give up that space, we might never get it back. So I'd like to thank Max Dupree for this call to arms, and I hope that you'll join me in a vote of thanks also. And I've got a small gift for him on behalf of the University and the Academic Freedom Committee. Thank you. <laughs>